Hello everyone, this is Douglas, and today I'm beginning a new programming project, a voxel ray marching renderer. In this devlog, I would like to describe the initial process of setting up the project and getting voxel meshes displayed on the screen, as you see here. Before we begin, I would like to address my goals for the project and the series of devlogs which I plan to create. I want to write a voxel ray tracer for a number of reasons. A while back, I was playing with rendering voxels using only their bounding boxes with the graphics API OpenGL. When it came time to add dynamic lighting and shadows, however, I discovered that the main method available to me was shadow mapping, where one essentially renders the scene from each light's perspective to determine what uh, the light is able to hit. I wanted multiple dynamic lights, and the lighting method best suited for this is ray tracing. With regards to this project, I hope to learn more about graphics programming. I also want to design and implement the graphics, physics, and storage algorithms myself, which should be a fun, intellectually engaging programming challenge. In the end, I want to build a cross-platform voxel game that supports large, editable meshes and multiplayer. Given these goals, I began the project by choosing a language and a graphics API. The language choice was easy. c -sharp is fast, heavily used in game development, and is incidentally my favorite language, so I went with C-sharp. The graphics API was not so easy. The kinds of things that I want to do are computationally expensive and best suited to run on a GPU, which can process many similar calculations simultaneously. I initially wanted to use CompuShaders and OpenGL, but since macOS doesn't support the version of OpenGL with CompuShaders, I ruled OpenGL out. I then decided to try OpenCL, the general purpose cousin of OpenGL, and I did get fairly far, as you can see I actually managed to get OpenCL set up to render to the screen, and I even had to draw a cube or two. At this point, however, I, I ruled out OpenCL as well. The library, while useful, is not particularly popular. It is widely supported, but it doesn't appear to me uh, to be particularly well maintained. And also to render with OpenCL, I had to also interop with OpenGL, which was kind of a pain. So that left only one cross-platform graphics API left, really, Balkan. Balkan is a next-generation graphics API, the successor to OpenGL. It is extremely powerful and provides programmers with an unprecedented amount of control over their applications. This makes the library rather verbose, though, and while I knew this from the outset, I was still staggered by just how complicated it was to set up. The Vulkan tutorial was over 900 lines of code long, just to draw one triangle on the screen. You have to instantiate a Vulkan instance, select a GPU, create a GPU device, create rendering pipelines for shaders, allocate memory for command pools, record command buffers, and more, all while creating gigantic structures that describe the settings that you want to use for each. It took me a week to finish the tutorial, and another week of rewriting my code base to be object-oriented, before I was fully ready to actually do any ray tracing. I'm certain I'll become more comfortable with the Vulkan paradigm as I continue to use the API, though. At long last, on to the ray tracing. Ray tracing is a technique by which a ray is drawn in 3D space for each pixel of the screen, and the objects intersected determine the pixel's color. More specifically, because I will be dealing with voxels, I'll be using ray marching, I draw a ray which intersects my voxel mesh, and if the voxel hit is solid, I color the pixel based on the, that voxel's color. Otherwise, I advance my ray one voxel deeper. This is ideal for lighting calculations because if you want to determine whether a voxel can be hit by a light, you simply cast another ray. If you want to have reflections, you simply have the ray bounce and continue after it, it hits a voxel. Ray tracing presents a lot of um, interesting uh, possibilities. In practice, of course, things are a bit more nuanced. I first had to decide how to store my voxel data and send it to the GPU. I chose to use sparse voxel octrees, which essentially divide up a voxel mesh into contiguous cubic regions that share the same characteristics. This allows for both data compression, keeping mesh sizes small, and for efficient ray tracing, because you can step through an entire octree branch at once. Sparse voxel octrees do have limitations, of course, but we will cross that bridge if we come to it. I was quite happy with the octree format I designed. It was able to store this 256 by 256 by 256 voxel grid, which would normally take up 16 megabytes at one byte per voxel, in under half a megabyte. 
With some fiddling, I was able to pass the data as a buffer to the GPU. Now, I was ready to ray march. I am performing my ray marching in a compute shader, a program on the GPU which runs independently of the graphics pipeline. I chose this path mainly because compute shaders can synchronize between invocations, which will allow for some optimizations, and because I can exactly control the invocation numbers. The voxel octree data is passed as a storage buffer to the shader, and the compute shader draws to an image, which is then drawn on the screen. The ray marching algorithm I devised, in essence, works like this. For each pixel, we begin by drawing a ray out of the screen. We calculate which objects the ray might intersect by checking whether the ray intersects the bounding boxes of each object. If that's the case, we advance the ray to the closest object and check if there is a voxel there. If so, then we're done. If not, we move the ray so that it leaves the octree in which the voxel resides and repeat the process. On screen, you can see what some of these octrees look like for different geometry, and I thought this effect when I first saw it was actually pretty cool. The bigger boxes all contain the same type of voxel, or lack thereof, so we're able to step, uh, step through the entire octree box at once, saving a lot of ray tracing calculations. I came up against two main issues while implementing my algorithm, which were caused by the imprecise nature of floating point coordinates. For one, my algorithm would get stuck in an infinite loop and crash, because a ray essentially got stuck cycling between two adjacent voxels, going from one to the other, and then back again. Secondly, my algorithm would sometimes lose track of the current voxel and stop ray tracing. I was able to debug and fix both of these issues with the open source software RenderDoc. RenderDoc actually allows you to step through GPU shader code and view variable values, which is something I didn't even know was possible. I struggled to get Vulkan to simply print out debug messages from the shaders into my console. To solve my issues, I modified the algorithm so that it was always guaranteed to take one step further away, preventing infinite loops. I also modified it to approximate the ray's position to the current voxel, so it wouldn't lose track of its position. Finally, having finished the core of the algorithm, I went back and optimized things, managing to get the rendering speed on my GTX 1070 down to about 7 through 10 milliseconds, and further optimizations are also possible. I have a few in mind for next time. As you can see on the screen, it renders quite well. One persistent problem which I couldn't seem to fix is this array here. I use it to keep track of the, object, uh, the objects that the array has hit, but when I increase the array size to a number like 8 or 16, the program becomes slower. Even though I'm not doing really any more work on the array, I'm still just doing a couple of random accesses that don't scale with array size. If I remove the shared qualifier here, which moves the variable from local memory into private memory, uh, it makes things much worse. Rendering takes almost double the amount of time. I'm not certain why this is, if I'm thrashing the GPU cache or forcing it to use global memory because the array is too big. But in the future, I do need uh, to figure out a way to mitigate this issue. In my next devlog, I hope to add further optimizations, textures, and perhaps some dynamic lighting. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to see the next part of my devlog series. Don't also forget to put your thoughts down in the comments below. Let me know if you would like more detailed, technical videos, or just quick progress updates like this one. Until next time.